Hello guys, this is Paul McWhorter from TopTechBoy.com and we are here today to talk about inertial measurement units, non-axis IMUs, non-axis inertial sensors. And this is to me one of the biggest challenging, most challenging projects that you can do in Arduino. And so I'm just going to see if there's any interest out there in me doing a tutorial on this and if there is, if there would be anybody willing to play along at home. Now I have tried to put a, and I've never done this before, a card where there's a questionnaire up in the upper screen. Uh, let's see, you should see a little I and if you click on that I, it should give you a survey and it'll be saying whether you are interested in playing along if I do a inertial measurement tutorial because I don't want to do a tutorial if there's no interest in it. I only want to do a tutorial in things that people would be interested in and want to play along with. So let's see, we've got some people tuning in, a tool. Uh, hi, uh, Folt, uh, hello, hello. Uh, Talking King, hello, uh, say, uh, Deuce Nasty, uh, hi, could you do a lesson on optical encoders and interrupts? I've done interrupts. If you go back to the old series of tutorials, my first Arduino tutorials, toward the end, I did a couple on interrupts. Uh, hello, everyone. Hey, from South Africa. Okay, good to see you. Okay, glad to see you guys. Let's uh, kind of look at this uh, non-axis inertial measurement sensor. And this is the BNO055 sensor. And then, as you guys know, I've kind of really started liking the Arduino Nano. And I've started doing, uh, I've kind of switched over to the Nano for the later lessons. You guys are going to get to the point that I really suggest you get a Nano. Because you see how clean this build is when you, do a, uh, when you use a Nano. The Nano will plug directly into the PC board or the breadboard. And then you can plug your sensor in. And if you see, there's only two connections between the Arduino and the BNO055. And then you just establish your ground and uh, and uh, power rails, and you are ready to go. So you can see it just takes a couple of minutes to hook up, and then you have a pretty cool looking uh, you have a pretty cool looking uh, circuit, and one that's pretty rugged. You know the wires aren't going to uh, pop out or anything like that. And so that is to me pretty interesting. Let's see. Uh, We've got some more hellos coming in. Uh, hi from Pakistan, Abdul. Hi. Oh, hello from Athens. Hey, we've got a worldwide audience here. Are you, sir, radar using Arduino? Mm, probably more than what I would know how to do. Radar, I'm wondering. I've got some ultrasonic lessons coming up, and you can do infrared. But like if you're talking real high frequency radar, that would be pretty high. That would be pretty hard. Hi from Brazil. Hello. Uh, where can I find the survey? OK, are you guys not seeing the survey? I was hoping that it would be up at the top with a little eye like a little eye in the upper of the video, but maybe you guys aren't seeing that up in the upper corner of the video. I tried to put a little eye that was tied to a survey, but perhaps you are not seeing that. Uh, hello from Yemen. Man, Yemen, welcome. Uh, India, hello, UK. Uh, Ireland, mm, boy, Australia. Man, we've got a real worldwide audience. I don't know if anyone in the United States is interested or if they're here. Uh, Sweden, I think. Uh, thank you very much, Aladdin. We got a lot of uh, nice people there. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how a, you know, we call this an inertial measurement unit and we call it non-axis. Well, what does that actually mean? That means that on this chip there are nine different sensors. And the three that are easiest to understand are three accelerometers. One accelerometer measures acceleration in the x direction. And as I move it like this, you will get a signal representing the acceleration and deceleration in X. The second sensor measures acceleration in Y. And so as you moved it this way, you would get a signal, an acceleration and deceleration in Y. And then finally, an acceleration and a deceleration in Z. And so those would be three different signals you would get three channels, three degrees of freedom. Now the next three are gyros, and they don't measure acceleration, they measure angular velocity. And so you have an x-axis gyro that measures rotational velocity around the x-axis, rotational velocity around about the y-axis, and rotational velocity 
about the z-axis. So this would be rotational uh, about z. And right, I'm using the right-hand rule. This is x, this is y, and then uh, you know you go x to y and your thumb points in the z direction. And so there we've got six axes. So we've got acceleration x, acceleration y, acceleration z. Then you have rotation about x, rotation about y, and rotation about z. And so those are six sensors that you have. Then there are, those are measuring motion. They're measuring inertial signals, sort of like force is equal to mass times acceleration type of type of stuff going on. But then also on the Earth, there is a magnetic field. And there are three sensors on here that measure that that magnetic vector. And so it finds a component of the magnetic field in the x direction, a component of the magnetic field in the y direction, and then a component of the magnetic field in the z direction. So all together, that's nine different sensor signals that are coming in. Wow, isn't that great? Look at all this data coming in. But then becomes the hard part. So right now I can hook this up and I can get those nine signals coming off really quickly. But the challenge becomes the challenge becomes when you try to take that data and start doing something useful with it. And that involves a lot of calculation and the math can be really, really, really hard. OK, are you guys, uh, could you let me know, do you, if you go up to the upper right corner, do you see a little eye in that eye? If you click on it, it has a survey whether you guys would be interested in this or not. Give me some feedback in the chat and tell me if you're able to see that that uh, that uh, user question or not. Uh, okay, not hearing from anyone. Let's see. Okay, so it sounds like somebody did answer. You guys, look in the questionnaire and let me know if you would be interested in a tutorial on this. Okay, so one thing that you can think is, is that you've got a, gra to, to say like, okay, how can you start getting orientation and understanding what orientation you are from those nine sensors? And the, sim the simplest thing is to think about uh, let's see if I can turn this back a little bit. The gravity vector. The gravity vector goes straight down. And so if I have a little suspended mass, when I am in this position, I have the greatest force down on that uh, suspended mass. If I tilt it, the force is less. And so imagine if you had a little diving board with a weight on it. When you're in this orientation, it's going to be bent down. The gap is going to be small, and you can measure that gap if you treat it like a capacitor. Well, if I bend it or if I tilt it like this, the little diving board is like this and that force vector that's still straight down is less. It's going to be bent over less. The gap is going to be smaller. So I can kind of like measure the capacitance of a suspended diving board with a weight on it. And then the capacitance is going to change as the gap between the diving board and the substrate change. Now, these things are microscopic. Microscopic, They're like microns or tens of microns across, but they're mechanical elements like a little diving board. Well, now if I have a diving board like this and then a diving board like this, I can have three of those accelerometers. And then you could say, oh, well, I could have an inclinometer where I could measure tilt based on those three uh, based on those three accelerometers. Yes, but then the problem is if you actually move it, now you're going to get a signal that's not associated with tilt. And so you're going to, you're going to interpret normal real acceleration as changes in tilt. So you see, that's why you need those other six sensors. Hello, everyone. Uh, I can see the survey eye in the top right. OK, then, man, type, uh, go to that survey. Let me know out there if you guys would be interested in this or not. I'm trying to also figure out how I can actually look at the results of the uh, I'm trying to see if I can see the results yet. OK, I'll have to figure out later to see what your uh, see what your response is. So maybe you guys just down in the chat could let me know. Is this something that you guys would be willing to play along at home with? or whether this is just not something you would be interested in. Because again, you know, we've done like what the first 11 or 12 lessons, 
I have like 65 Arduino lessons queued up that I'm going to be letting go in those uh, week by week, and those are going to get more and more and more complicated. But then I want to get you to the point that you are really doing, uh, you are really doing a more complicated project that really involves a lot of math, and that is this inertial measurement. So let me see if I can pique your interest and show you what I have actually done here. So I am going to go to a different different view. Okay. Now, do you see what we have here? We kind of have a virtual world. Let's see if I can get a little bit better camera angle here. I kind of messed my camera up. Okay. So, uh, I am so obsessive compulsive. Okay. All right. So, do you see what we have up here? we have like a virtual representation of what you see in the real world. So do you see my hand is coming down to the real world and I touch this. Boom! Do you see that? I am taking the data off of this sensor and I am changing it into tilt. Okay, so let's think what I am doing here. Remember x-axis is the long axis, so I am tilting above and below the x-axis, and that is what you can see happening up here. And then let me tilt, uh, that was tilting above the y-axis, okay. You know, you got to use that right-hand rule. Now let's tilt about the x-axis, and we've got that, and now let's spin around the z-axis. All right, do you see what's happening? That whatever I do in the real world, is reflected in the virtual world. Now, I'll tell you what is pretty easy is, it's pretty easy to do one of these things. Maybe you would rather have a different view. How about this view? Okay. What's pretty easy is to do the math using the accelerometers. Okay. The acceleration will give you tilt and tilt, and it will give you tilt and tilt. And it will work as long as you're not moving like this where the acceleration signal, the real acceleration is going to be interpreted as tilt. But then what you can do is you can also look at the gyro signal. So if you take the gyro signal and the accelerometer signal, that gyro signal will that measures rotational velocity, that will help you filter out the noise from acceleration. So you look at the gyro and you look at the accelerometer and you can sort of filter out the, uh, you know, you can filter out the false signals from uh, shaking or bouncing or real acceleration. Okay, but this is the problem, is doing this way, if you think of that gravity vector that's coming straight down, when I'm spinning like this, I cannot detect that with the accelerometer and the gravity vector. And that's why you have to have the three magnetometers, because you're then looking at... Uh, hi, Paul, from Science Museum of Minnesota. A couple of us around the shop uh, have found your videos extremely helpful. Thanks, Amelia. Hey, D. Bailey, thanks. Glad to hear that. Always glad to hear that people are watching. Okay, so I could do this with an accelerometer and a gyro, and I could do this with an accelerometer and a gyro, but when you start doing this, there is no change in that gravitation vector, and so I cannot do that just with accelerometers and gyros. I've got to be looking at how I am lining up with that magnetic field of the Earth, and that's how I get this. Okay, the other thing that I will say is, is that it is relatively simple. It is relatively simple to do tilts where you're below 45 degrees. So if you were thinking about something like a car and you're tilting, between 0 and 45 degrees, or maybe you go around a corner and tilt like this, or maybe you turn. Okay, that's pretty easy. Or even like if you had a little Cessna, you know, it's going to be going like this. But what happens like if you have a jet fighter where you might be going like this? Okay, the problem is the math breaks at that point, and you start getting something that's called gimbal lock. You know, you know how you're not supposed to divide by zero? Well, it's like you start dividing by zero, and uh, therefore the thing breaks. And so the impressive thing that I don't know if you can see really or you can appreciate is, you see, I am not getting gimbal lock. Look at this. I take it like this, 
and then I can rotate it up, I can rotate it upside down, I can come back and I can go all the way around or I can come up and do you see how I'm never losing my orientation that the uh, you know the green thing represents the nano the blue thing represents the uh, sensor and you see no matter where I put it there's no glitchy behavior and these like straight up and straight down yeah like watch the whole thing crash here as I say that but in these straight up and straight down positions where it's really really hard to get the math working I have it and I kinda have a complete 360, 360, 360 orientation without having any glitches. And so I think that is pretty cool. Let's see, I've got some questions. Is there a solution string uh, PID controller? Yeah, I'd like to do a PID controller one day. Uh, have some way to zero the gyro. Well, zeroing things out, gyros have a lot of drift. So the nice thing about a gyro is you're measuring rotational velocity, which is good. It's very good at looking at changes in velocity, but the problem is gyros have a lot of drift. Okay, accelerometers have no drift at, at all, but they have noise. So accelerometers have no drift and noise. Gyros have no noise, but have drift. And so you've got to bring that data together. And that is sort of where... Uh, uh, that is sort of where things get hard. How are you showing the visuals? Uh, okay, how are you showing the visuals? I'm not sure. Okay, how did I create this 3D visual? All right, let me kind of take you through it. Uh, this BNO 055, you can get all nine signals off of it. Acceleration XYZ, gyro XYZ, and then uh, and then uh, magnetometer XYZ and then you can do a bunch of math and you can translate that into kind of Euler angles. So let me talk to you a little bit about what Euler angles are. Like imagine this is an airplane. Okay, let me see if I can get you a better airplane. Okay, so this uh, Okay, can you imagine that this Okay, uh, can you imagine that this is an airplane, so this is a wing? Okay, pitch is an angle up or an angle down. Okay, so if you had the airplane, if the nose goes up, that's positive pitch. If the nose goes down, that's negative pitch. So which direction is the airplane flying? Well, you need to know pitch. Okay, now you also need to know yaw. Am I going north, east? Well, if you called north zero, then you have an angle that goes from zero to 360, and that is yaw. Okay, now I could have pitch and yaw at the same time. So I could be going east, and I could be going up with a pitch of 45 as I'm going east. So those are two different angles. But the problem is those two angles are not enough for an airplane because you can also bank, right? You can bank. So at a certain heading in a certain... Uh, pitch, I can still bank. And so the Euler angles, you take those nine signals coming off of the sensor and you create something that represents roll, which is this. This is going left and right. This is the nose of the airplane, by the way. And then pitch, which is up and down, and then yaw or heading. Okay, and so you can get those three numbers by doing a lot of math on those, uh, you know, you, by doing a lot of math on those signals that are coming off of the sensor. Okay, but let me tell you what, uh, let me tell you what, uh, all right, I am going to have to block someone here. Okay. Yes, sir, you just got blocked. Okay, guys, why do you slow me up with that nonsense and I have to come in and and uh, block you guys? Okay, so yeah, how am I doing this? Okay, so l let me finish talking about uh, Euler angles. So I have nine signals that are coming from the sensor and then I generate three Euler angles and those three Euler angles are roll, pitch, and yaw. 
Okay, and that would work for up to 45 degrees if you were just doing things like this. Okay, but the problem is, like, if you have a jet fighter, he might want to go straight up. Okay, and you can't have your software crash when it's straight up. And this sort of shows you kind of like how you could think of it. So let me see if I can go to this. And let's just say that this direction, look at the simulation. This direction is north, east, south, west. Okay, so I've got north east. Okay, so like if I put it here and I ask you what direction I'm going, you would say east, right? Well, what if I pitch up at 45 degrees and I say, which direction am I going? Well, you would still say east. I'm flying east or I'm flying south, I think. Okay, flying south. And I could come up here and I'm still flying south or I could come here and I'm still flying south, right? So south has a meaning, or let's go east. East has a meaning even if I am pitching up. East still has a meaning, or east has a meaning, like you'd say, where are you going east? East, let's call 90 degrees. That has a meaning, right? But what happens if I go all the way straight down, okay? I'm going all the way straight and down. Okay. Now, does east still have a meaning? No, east does not have a meaning anymore. I'm not going east. I'm going straight down. So all of a sudden that Euler angle on yaw becomes meaningless because I am a orthogonal to that axis. So if you are doing software and all of a sudden you have something that doesn't mean anything, okay, does east mean anything when I am like this? No, east doesn't mean anything. But am I still oriented in three-dimensional space? Yes. So when I'm completely vertical, I can't have the thing glitch out on me. Do you see how I'm vertical, but it's still a real object in real space? Okay. But the Euler angles can't handle that because Euler angle on yaw is thinking about east. And when I'm orthogonal to that, it has no meaning at all. Okay, let's see. You need a moderator to do your blocking stuff so you can concentrate. Yes, I need more help. I need a staff. I need assistance. I need people that bring me fancy little foods and things like that. But it is a one-man show here. I don't have any... Uh, Okay, hey man, we're going to have to block our second guy here. Wow, why do you guys have nothing better to do than to get yourself blocked? I also found that it's interesting, like, you know, just like, if you don't like my channel and you don't like me, wouldn't it be kind of cool just to go somewhere else? Right? I don't hate you or anything, just go somewhere else. But I don't understand why we get so much, uh, so much of this nonsense. Yes, I need a moderator. Okay. And that one, yep, uh, yeah, had to block a couple of people. Okay, so that is a little bit, so how am I doing this where I'm working at these verticals when you can't do that with Euler angles? Well, there is this math, and it's called quaternions. And like most of you know, like somewhere along the way, you, you learned about imaginary numbers. And let's talk a little bit about how imaginary numbers work. Let's see. So, you know, you spent your whole life, and you spent your whole life like on the number line, right? And the number line is like 0, 1, 2, 3, minus 1 minus two, minus three, like that. Like you spent your whole life on the number line and you have real numbers and you have integers and you have rational and you have irrational and you just spent your life from the first day of first grade going back and forth on this number line, okay? But then one day what you found is there's numbers that are not on the number line and those are called imaginary numbers. And so like you can do things where you fall off the number line and you're just floating around in space here and you're no longer on the number line. And so the way you deal with that is you find out that there was a second number line that they never told you about. And that number line is the imaginary number line. And it is orthogonal to the real number line. And instead of counting one, two, three, you count I, I2, I3. And you learn that I is not a letter, it's not a variable. I is a, uh, oh man, I've got another guy to block here. 
this is uh, this is amazing. That's like three people. I could be your mod if you'd like. I don't know how to do that. How do I make someone a mod? Maybe we'll need to figure that out. Maybe some of you guys could help me. Okay, so we've got the real number line going this way, and we've got the imaginary number line going this way. Now the problem is is that they name these things imaginary numbers where really they're just as real as anything else. I mean in almost all engineering to solve engineering problems you have to use these numbers called imaginary numbers and the truth is usually you're not on the imaginary number line or the real number line you're like out here like let's say you go over two and up two that that would be the number two plus I2. Okay, you do complex numbers. All right, so then most engineering, because anything dealing with waves or sine waves or periodic signals, you've got to use uh, imaginary numbers or complex numbers. So they're just as real as real numbers. And if you do anything other than accounting, you're going to find yourself using these things. So they become almost second nature. So just when you get comfortable with the fact that there is an imaginary number i, then what you learn is there is not just an imaginary number line. There is, in fact, an imaginary room. OK, there is an imaginary room. And this is our old friend i. Remember the imaginary number that you know about. But then there's two other orthogonal imaginary axes that you did not know about. And you can fall off the i and you can land on the j. And then you can fall off the ij and you can land on the k. And so you have ijk and that is, oh man, here we go again. I'll tell you, uh, I just don't know why somebody somebody would not have something better to do than sit here and do this nonsense. Okay, we blocked some more people. All right, I need help with moderation. Man, this imaginary number stuff is pretty important. So. First of all, you found out that there was another number line they didn't tell you about the imaginary one. And then like you live in the real world, like I'm in a room and this room has X and Y and Z. OK, and it's like real X, real Y, real Z. I'm moving around in X, Y, Z. Then I found out there's this thing I can't see that's not X, Y, Z. It's this imaginary thing, I, but I kind of understand it and I can use it. Then I find out that there is an imaginary room and that imaginary room has an I, a J and a K and I can wander around in this imaginary room, okay? And you know what you find when you get to the imaginary room and you look in the imaginary room? What you find inside the imaginary room, you find a ruler in the imaginary room. You find a ruler in the imaginary room. And you know what kind of numbers are on the ruler? real numbers. So in the imaginary room, there is one axis of real numbers. And so for quaternions, what you have is you have four numbers and you sort of have uh, I, J, and K, like some number associated with I, J, and K. And usually the value that multiplies I is X, uh, X, Y, and Z. OK, but then what you also have is you have a real number W. And so now you have four numbers, three different orthogonal imaginary numbers, and you have a real number W. Those are called quaternions and you have to use quaternions or I believe that really the only way I really know how to make this thing work where it doesn't mess up in these orthogonal positions is to use quaternions. And so this whole thing uses quaternions. Now, the, uh, okay, we have got another guy to block here. Okay. OK, we got that taken care of. So the only way to make this work is with quaternions. All right, is with quaternions. I guess you can do it with like directional cosine matrices and some really heavy duty matrix operations. But the math is pretty daunting. Again, if you just want to go 45 degree changes, you can kind of do it with trigonometry like 
normal mortal person trigonometry. But if you want to go and really do the superhero stuff here, and maybe you guys don't know enough to know how hard this is to make this work, but if you want to do the superhero thing, you really want to do quaternions. Okay, so a little bit about this B on N O O55 sensor that I have hooked up here. It will send you all nine signals: acceleration x, acceleration y, acceleration z, gyro x, gyro y, gyro z, magnetometer x, magnetometer y, magnetometer z, and you can start doing some trigonometry and you can get some simple stuff like this to work. The nice thing about the BNO 055, it will also report to you directly the Euler angles, roll, pitch, and yaw, the three where they do all the math. The chip does the math and directly gives you the Euler angles. I have played around with those and they have not implemented it perfectly. And their Euler angles tend to work pretty well if you only go to tilts, like rolls or pitches between plus, uh, plus 45 and minus 45. But if you try to do something like this, their Euler angles start acting really glitchy. What is the incredibly good news? The incredibly good news is, is that this chip will give you the four Euler or the four quaternions. So it'll give you the X, the real part, and then the or the W, which is the real part, and then the X, Y, Z, which are the imaginary parts. Now, there's a lot of different conventions on using quaternions and which one, whether the first one reported is real and then the three imaginary or which order they are or what letter is associated with which one. So, so you have to understand there's a lot of different conventions. And so you've got to make sure that you're speaking the same language when you start working with these things. But uh, what would be some kind of cool things that we could do with this? Okay. Okay, I'm trying to stay on top of this. Uh, okay, so uh, this is kind of what I have done and what I am thinking about now is I am thinking about doing a tutorial. And what I would do in the tutorial is start by just hooking this up and then the next thing I would do is start working with those nine raw signals that come off and see if we can do some trigonometry to get a little simple demo like this working. We would start just by looking at the serial monitor on the Arduino. Then what we would do is we would start sending the data over to Python. And that's how I am doing this, that you see I have the serial cable and then I'm running this to a PC. On the PC I'm running Python and then I am reading the data from the serial port on Python, and then I'm doing the calculations in Python to make all of this work. And then the graphic is done with the library module called vPython for Visual Python. So Python and Visual Python, and we could be here. So what I would do is I would start just working with the serial monitor, taking the raw signals. Then I would take those raw signals and try to get approximations for roll, pitch, and yaw, and just look at them on the serial monitor. Then I would send them over to Python and see if we could do a simple visual based on the Euler angles that we're calculating. And then finally, we would do the full-blown job with the quaternion okay and again the nice thing about this is you can program it where it will spit out four good quaternions and then you can do the general case okay I have uh, I have been neglecting the comments let's see so if you've already uh, if you've already commented uh, if you've already commented I can't go back and catch up with those and so I am going to need you to start again with your comments and I will just try to start right now. Sir, make a video on Arduino Bluetooth. I hate Bluetooth. Bluetooth never works. I can never make Bluetooth work. I just bought a new car, a Toyota, and uh, it wants to hook to my phone through Bluetooth. And when I get in the car, my phone crashes because the, the car computer is trying to talk to the phone. It's a, it's a new iPhone. And... Uh, you know, it's just anytime I use Bluetooth, it breaks my heart. So I don't want to program in Bluetooth. Okay. Uh, let's see. Excellent video. Thank you. Uh, 
some span answer everyone question what you have learned okay can you comment on ESP Wi-Fi module with a camera okay I've done a video where I take a Raspberry Pi Zero like this okay Raspberry Pi Zero and I hook a small camera to it and then live stream from the camera so if you're interested in live video over Ethernet or over Wi-Fi. I've got a I've got videos for a Raspberry Pi 3 and I've got videos for a Pi Zero. So I don't know if I would really do that on an ESP32. Thanks for uh okay. Okay, good Bob, thank you. Paul, you did you solder on the pin header for the BNO65? Good question. I believe yes, you have to solder it. And I don't think I did the soldering. And if you look at it, it's not a terrible soldering job, but it is not the cleanest soldering job that I've ever seen. But I would say that that's kind of acceptable. Okay, Arduino Shield with B with Bosch 10 axis. I guess 10 axis would also have pressure. Uh, I think that would be interesting because you could add to this orientation you could add the to the orientation you could add up and down altitude so that could be kind of interesting all right Wi-Fi module uh, I've not done Wi-Fi on the Arduino but I have on my old series of lessons done some XB radio stuff and I think I did do Ethernet over Arduino over Ethernet and so you can go back and look at those old lessons if you want to brush up on that Okay, <coughs> Amir, yes, hi Paul, wanted to thank you for sharing with us your knowledge. Oh, wonderful, thank you, that's very nice, okay. Perseo Lima, I'm from Brazil, actually I work in a school that uses Arduino, Lego EV3, and some stuff like that. You know, I don't like the Lego stuff, I like to get down, like if you walk around NASA, you see things that look a lot like an Arduino, that's like, you know, maybe not the Arduino itself, maybe sometimes, but what you'll see is those processors on there you're working like people work in the real world and when you go to Lego you're kind of doing I don't know I don't like Lego I don't like the Lego stuff I got like the Lego super robotic kit or whatever I can't think of Mindstorm or Mindspring or something like that and I was severely disappointed with it severely disappointed with it okay thanks uh, from uh, thanks for the new Arduino curse why is thanks for the new Arduino curse not understanding you greetings from Germany Bosch has fusion software they claim improves okay uh, the stuff this is the problem that I had with this BNO 55 this is like a super cool demo here but what we actually tried to use it for was we have a high gain antenna and we were trying to use that high gain antenna to track, track our high altitude balloon. So the high altitude balloon has a GPS on it. It radios back its lat long coordinates. Then from home base, we know what heading and what elevation we need to point to in order to be pointing right at the balloon. So we put one of those one of these BNO 55s on that antenna so we would know what its orientation was. And what would happen is like every five minutes it would want to automatically recalibrate. Now we had manually recalibrated it deliberately and carefully and perfectly when we started, okay? But then immediately it wants to go and automatically recalibrate and then maybe it would get noise or goofy stuff and stop it. And there was no way to turn that auto calibration off. And so we found it to be extremely painful to use in a real system where you're trying to have a feedback system where you take action based on the numbers that are coming off of the sensor. And so something like a drone or an unmanned aerial <coughs> vehicle or pointing things in the real world, I'm going to have to give the BNO 55 a thumbs down because it was just too, you couldn't control it. It would want to run off and do things and then it wouldn't do them the way that I wanted them to. Good morning. What is the camera? What is that camera 3D setup? Well, this is not a camera here. This is a 3D. This, where my hand is, is a camera. The other th thing is a 3D simulation based on the Python. Okay, uh, yeah, Bosch claims they have Fusion software. I don't like the way it works, but it's really fun to just play with it. 
Okay, uh, good morning. What is that camera setup? We talked about that. You've always given uh, great intellectual content. Well, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, sir, can you tell me which software is in use for the simulation? It is vPython. I am piping data from the Arduino up to vPython running on the PC. Some drones can do that. Okay, I'm struggling to choose a path in electrical engineering. I have the choice to specialize in <coughs> industrial automation, electronics, sensors, and microelectronics. Oh, all of those are exceptional choices. I was in microelectronics where I worked down at the atomic level on integrated circuits, so like I would develop the atomic physics that would define the transistor that would be the basic building block and then people would take that transistor and then build their integrated circuits around it because everything in an integrated circuit is just zeros and ones it's ons and offs and those ons and offs are built with transistors and so I would create the basic building block and they would go on to <coughs> build integrated circuits from that I love microelectronics. I love nanotechnology. I have a couple of dozen patents. Some, some of the first nanotechnology and MEM stuff uh, that's now in, like the BN, BNO55 is actually MEMS or nanotechnology, microscopic mechanical elements. And I had a lot of the original patents in that stuff. Okay, those are all industrial automation. I love all of those. Okay. Uh, Hook up an Arduino and do something cool and CB your ham radio. You know, I've kind of gotten out of the ham radio stuff. I got like my extra license in ham, but a lot of the ham guys are kind of grumpy old guys. And they were kind of rude to some of the kids. Like the kids all got, my students all got their ham radio license. And and then they got their little Baofeng $30 radios. And they were running around talking on the radio and, and, and you know, doing everything perfectly legal, perfectly legal. But one of them said 10-4 on a ham band. And oh my goodness, you would have thought that they had posted porn or something. I mean, it was just absolutely ridiculous. People got so mad and were very angry at them that you can't do that. Well, there's no law against saying 10-4. It's not what ham guys do. But, you know, if you want young people to get into the ham field, you guys are going to have to stop being such cr cr old curmudgeons. Right. So so the kids lost interest because the old guys were so rude. And so I kind of am not pursuing ham stuff anymore, even though I have my extra license. Uh, OK, cool. Is there any suggestions for beginners? If you're talking about Arduino, I would suggest you go to tutorial number one and start looking at it. OK. Uh, all right. Let's see. Hello, Brow Bunny see that you're following along. Okay, you guys, are there any questions on the non-axis stuff that we're talking about here? Are there any questions on the non-axis stuff that we're talking here? And I'm trying to still get a feel for whether, <clears throat> I'm still trying to get a feel for whether there would be interest if I did a, a tutorial series to get you guys where you can kind of get to this level of functionality. Okay, let's see here. Coming, trying to get back over here to the chat. Okay, what do you need license for with radio? I don't know anything about that. If you are going to use the ham bands, ham radio, you have to have a license. There is a technician license which allows you to talk around town and talk on repeaters and talk maybe 5 to 20 miles. If you want to talk across the country or across the world, you have to get a general license. And then if you want to talk on the elite bands, you have to get an extra license. And so I got my technician general an extra license. OK, please explain what a PID controller is. That is where you control the speed of something based on uh, math. And so like I want to turn a motor at 10 RPMs, it's at 12 RPMs. I'm going too fast, I need to slow down. So you look at your speed and then you apply a signal so that the actual match is the desired. And PID, you're doing three things. You control a portion of the signal is proportional to the error. A portion of the signal is proportional to the derivative of the error. That's calculus, the calculus derivative. And a portion of the signal is proportional to the integral of the area. It is really good. Okay, Rob Jr. says he's interested. Todd says he's interested. Bob says he's interested. Is there still opportunities in biomims? Yeah. 
<clears throat> my company Mimex uh, did a lot of biomedical work, and I think biomims is a really really exciting field. Okay. Uh, yes, tutorial series. Okay, I'm interested. All right, it seems like that we're getting pretty, uh, a lot of interest. Okay, we've got somebody saying, off the subject, would like a short series on the Maker 1010, exploring its capabilities. Any hope? I do not know what the Maker 1010, MKR 1010 is. I do not know that. And guys, for me to do a tutorial series, it's got to be something that there's going to be lots of people interested in. And a lot of these things are kind of like one-offs, like these guys came out with this new thing that was supposed to be better than the Arduino called the onion, or then somebody comes up with the banana pie instead of the raspberry pie. There's so many different things. I've got to get behind a platform that there's going to be some momentum behind. Okay, thanks for answering questions. I wish I could engage in your presentation better, but I'm not so familiar with what you were discussing. Okay, I am too. Is there any way to make a communication between 0 and 10 volts and 0 to 24 volt uh, sensors to Arduino board? You're going to have to step that voltage down, sir. You're going to have to have something probably between that and your Arduino because your Arduino is a 5-volt device. Okay, so it seems like the questions are kind of slowing up. Uh, you guys, when this thing goes live, maybe you could go back and leave a comment, or when this thing goes uh, as a normal video, you could leave a comment down in the comments because I think this chat more or less goes away. And let me know whether there would be enough interest for me to do this. And like I say, I've got 65 Arduino lessons queued up that are coming out one by one. Okay. But then after that, right now I'm ready to move on and I would be kind of interested in doing this, but I would need to see that there would be interest from you guys. And some of you guys would actually get, get the sensor and follow me. You can't follow me with one of the little three buck inertial measurement sensors. It's this BNO 55 that really takes care of some of the quaternion math for you. And so you would need to be willing to get this. Uh, you would need be willing to get this uh, micro. How do I use this module? with nine axis to get a drone not to crash that man you got to be careful because like I'm showing you how to make cool little things to impress your girlfriend okay these are cool little things to impress your girlfriend or your mom man if you're putting something on a drone you've got to really know what you're doing because what is a drone it is a flying blender do you want to fly a blender into your face or someone else's face? And so that's why I don't do tutorials on drones. And you should not use the things I teach for drones because if you come up and somebody gets mad at me because you flew a blender in their face, I'm not going to be happy. Okay. Uh, how to send gyro data by Bluetooth? I hate Bluetooth. I hate Bluetooth. I hate else statements after if statements. I hate people who put spaces in file names. How do I use this? Okay. Using Eagle would be great. Don't know Eagle, but I would like to one day do a tutorial on how to make PC boards. Okay. Sir, when we are learning this, I mean, which lesson? Well, you, we got to get the 65 Arduino lessons that I've already made. And then if there's interest, I can make a series on this. But I'm releasing two videos a week. And I think more than that, you overwhelm people. And so these, if I make them, I would start making them now, but they would come out after those other ones have been released. Okay. I don't know what a parallel Parallax 8 microcontroller is. You got to remember, I worked at the transistor level. I worked at the atomic level. It was after I got out of my company in my professional engineering career that I started tinkering with the Arduino. So I do not, I am not a microcontroller expert. Can you make more lessons like lesson 13? What was lesson 13? I don't remember what that one was. Okay, uh, your lessons have been a great help and very deeply appreciated. Well, thank you so much. Okay, Henry, will you make a post saying what we would need in order to buy? Look down below. You need a Nano, which the official one is 19 bucks, and then you need this sensor, which is 36 bucks. But there would be a whole lot of learning with this and a whole lot of things that we could do. So I think it would be, uh, I think it would be uh, good for that. James Hall, I would get one. Well, good, Todd, you're less okay. Uh, 
when will PID control Arduino tutorial come? Okay, the reason I haven't done a PID motor controller because you have to have a motor. And if you have a motor, you have to control it with a transistor. And if you control it with a transistor, you also have to know how fast the motor is going. So you have to have like a wheel with slots in it and then an optical encoder. And as that wheel spins around, it interrupts the beam between the LED and the photo sensor and then you count those interruptions and then you know how fast the motor is going. The hardest thing about a PID motor controller is understanding how fast the motor is spinning and I'm just really wondering man there would be a million different people with a million different motors and a million different transistors and then even if I had like Amazon links where you could order the stuff that spinning disk it's really like you need to 3D print it and also the motor just shaking around the table isn't going to work so you need to 3D print a little case or a holder for the motor so then I'm thinking you're talking about a hundred dollars worth of stuff and then you're talking about needing access to a 3d printer and I'm afraid there would be like 10 people who would actually follow given those barriers a PID uh, motor controller show your setup for making videos do you really want to see man do you really want to see my studio okay do you really want to see my studio? I don't think you do. Okay, but I will show it to you. It is pretty embarrassing. This is my desk. Okay, do you see that? Does this look like just a horrible rat's nest of a mess? Okay, so it might look like it, but it's just like I actually know where almost everything is. I don't lose things, but this is kind of a picture of my brain. I've got like a hundred different things going on all at the same time. My overall room is a little bit neater. Okay. I've cleaned up a little bit and then you can see I've got some uh, umbrella lights and then back behind me I have a green screen. And then this is where the magic happens. This is Wirecast. And Wirecast al allows me to change shots and stuff. And I really, really, really wish I had like someone to help me with the production here. I wish I had someone to help me with the production, but I don't. And so I've kind of got to just wing it doing the best I can. Okay. Are you optimistic about the future of autonomous cars and boats? I think we're probably getting there. I think we eventually will. I just bought a Toyota car. And uh, I just bought it because it's just something that came up. I just really needed to get another car. So I just went down and bought a new Toyota Camry. I didn't even look at it. I just called them on the phone and said, man, do you have a white Camry? They said, yeah. I said, well, I'll give you this much. They said, okay, come pick it up. I just went and got it and came home, new Camry. Driving home, it was like the steering wheel was going like this. I thought, what is going on? And so it's like I took my hand off the wheel. And if you started drifting out of your lane, it would correct and then it'd go to the other side and correct. It's, it's like just this kind of like entry level cheap Toyota Camry was almost driving itself. And then also it's got like a radar. So the cruise control smartly slows down if you're coming up on someone. And I'm kind of impressed with the state of the technology so far. Okay. Dexter says it looks like my desk. Looks like my desk. <laughs> okay, so so some of you, uh, some of you uh, understand what a crazy deranged mind is and what kind of desk that uh, that looks like. Okay, yeah, there's a link for what we need. If money was no limit, what would you build? Uh, I'm, uh, what my real passion is, is organic farming and, uh, you know, in improving the sustainability of farming. Like I have a hydroponic greenhouse where I grow most of the food I eat year round. And so my interest, my primary passion is not these things. It's applying these things to other things that I'm really, really interested in. So I have chickens and I have uh I have a hydroponic greenhouse and I have an organic farm that I'm putting together where I'm trying to see like on three acres, can I be completely self-sufficient where I grow all the food that I eat and also support like a staff of five or 10 people? Like can I feed 10 to 15 people on three acres? It's kind of like one of those interesting mental challenges. Somewhere in there, I think there's a reality show. So I'm a little bit thinking about doing a reality show on my little farm project. Okay. I see that coffee cream. Oh yeah. I, I don't use this creamer. All right. I, I do not use this creamer. I don't even know why it's here. 
In the morning, I make two really strong shots of espresso coffee, and then I froth whole organic whipping cream, and I put the coffee in the cream. So I have like a half a cup of cream every morning for breakfast, and it's really delicious. I don't drink that poison. Uh, I don't drink that poison stuff. Okay, but uh, yeah, that's on there. You know what? Did you guys notice? Tell me what's missing today. Nobody noticed what was missing today. You guys watch my videos and you didn't know what was missing? Tell me what was missing. Yeah, Toyota makes a, okay, let's see. Uh, USB 2.0 for Arduino and Teensy and Mystery is hard to develop and analyze. Okay, uh, now that's an engineering desk. Yes, it is. Okay, I'm surprised someone hasn't fired me over my mess in here. Toyota does make a good car. My last Toyota Tacoma pickup is 15 years old, has 175,000 miles, and the only thing I've done is like change the oil and battery and wipers and things, uh, uh, things like that. Yeah, the the car is good. Shoot, came in late. Good morning. Sounds cool. I plan on making cheats for tests and physics. I will make a calculator with Arduino. Okay, calculator with Arduino. That's good. Your tutorial not just teaches technical, but how you enjoy work. Okay, that's good. Uh, I have to go now. All right. Good to see you. I'm interested in vertical micro crop farming as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just interested in this whole thing of like I'm against industrial farming and like the food you get in the grocery store is genetically modified and full of poison and everyone is fat and everyone is dying of cancer and getting back to sustainable agriculture where we're eating healthy natural foods. I have a real passion for that. I would love some gardening videos. Okay, well, what I am going to do, uh, I will be doing that. You guys know I, uh, I have a home in Africa that I spend quite a bit of time at, and I would really like to do some very serious sustainable agriculture videos, but those will be on another channel, so do not bore, uh, bore people. I do not have a Patreon account. I do not have a Patreon account, but thank you for asking. You could always do a super chat if you wanted to. Yes, what is missing? Ice coffee. Okay, who got that? Finally, that was Mayank Shigan, Shiganoker. Sorry, I do not know. Yes, the iced coffee is missing. Andrew saw it too. James Hall saw it. Yeah, where is your mug? Okay, so I got up this morning. I get up at 5. I go downstairs, and I have a little super automatic uh, espresso machine. So I make like 10 shots of espresso, and then I put it in that big mug. And it's not a Yeti, but it's like a Yeti. It's, it's a really good mug. And then I sit, and I sip that iced coffee all day. So I had the ice. I put the eight to ten shots of espresso and I sat it down and I walked out and I forgot the coffee so waiting at home is a wonderful iced coffee do you have any experience with Aki, Ikea hydroponic kits what's the missing yeah yeah I don't use hydroponic kits I kind of build them and there's really great components at Crop King and I do the NFT let lettuce and I do the Beto buckets and I have some ebb and flow. I am not doing aquaponics because I don't think aquaponics really work. I think it's a great in concept but I think in practice it doesn't really work. Yes, I miss you guys caught on. I am missing my nice big iced coffee. Working on encoding rotation with two optical sensors and a tooth wheel to control colors. That sounds like an interesting and challenging project. I would love to see a video like that. I can actually have a chance to be related to. I actually have a chance to be related to Nikola Tesla. I am Serbian in his villages. Nikola Tesla, I think, is the most brilliant man that ever lived. I mean, Einstein and Bohr and all those people. I think the two greatest geniuses that ever lived were Nikola Tesla and... Uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, okay? Uh, but then also Nikola Tesla was insane. He was absolutely mad insane. So I find it interesting that you kind of have people, like I'll draw you a picture here of how I view the world, okay? So you have average people, like here's an average person. And then you come this way, and let's see, I hope I can get this to focus. So you see, this is just your average person. Then you have people coming this way that are smart, okay, smarter than average. And then you have people coming this way that are dumber than average. So the further you come out this way, the smarter you are. The further away from average, the smarter you are. The further away in this direction, the dumber you are. But the, these two things, if you go far enough out, they're not a straight line. They begin to curve. 
and they actually curve to where you end up back here at this point that is like a crazy like what's the ultimate in as dumb as you possibly be could be you get crazy and then as smart as you could imaginably be and you get crazy and so it comes here that really super genius people tend to also be kind of crazy and that was Nikola Tesla he was like so crazy he actually became insane okay uh, Hi, bud. Like the look of this, but the cost of the sensor is a bit high for me, but have seen another one. No, it will not work because the thing about this one is this one gives you the quaternions. And to go from the nine axis and create the quaternions, that is harder than something I can teach you to do. I work for an industrial sensor company. If you need some, let me know. All right. Very uh very nice there. Thank you. Mmm, nice coffee. Yeah, I've got one sitting at home waiting for me. LT Spice. I am not into spice. I learned spice and I use spice, but I'm old school. I like I like doing things by hand. So I might one day teach you how to do circuit analysis. And you know, like I learned things old school. And when I got out into industry, what I started seeing happening is people that relied on simulation package, uh, packages, they would come in like with a transistor design and say, here, this is what I got. I'd say, well, that can't work because you're going to short the emitter to the base. There's no way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here's my spice code. I say, I don't care about your spice code. There's no way this would work. And they would sit and argue with me. I'd say, OK, go get a transistor and build it. And then you'd see the little puff of smoke come out of their office. And then they would come in. Oh, well, I see. I didn't set the simulation up right. Yeah, because you're an idiot and you don't know how to do real engineering and you believe whatever the computer tells you. So I am not going to teach spice, but I might teach you how to really analyze a circuit. Uh, OK, hey, all three of my uh, channels you're subscribed to. Great. I'd like to, on that third channel, actually go back and make some videos about that again. Uh, one day. Okay. What's the difference between hydro and aquaponics? Hydroponics, you mix chemicals into the water to make nutrients. And in aquaponics, you have a big fish tank and the fish dirty the water. And it's that dirty fish water that goes to feed the plants. And so it's this brilliant thing like, oh, the fish are pooping and that's feeding the plants. And then as the plants eat the poop, it's cleaning the water. And so you have this symbiotic relationship between the fish and the plant. It's just too hard to make work because it's just too hard to make work that the the you're sharing water between plants and fish and the plants want one thing and the fish want something else and then things get out of whack. So I do not think that it is going to work. Uh, thanks again for this. Uh, it's OK. Uh, it's the creative part of the mind that is also a bit crazy. Yes. And artists also tend to be crazy. And so there, there's a strange thing that's really interesting. Thanks again for the great videos. Okay, maybe an application would be a smart shelf with weight sensors. That's interesting. Can you do a hydroponic build series? Currently, I'm trying to build a uh, clo closet farm for my room. Okay, I would get there's like I would get a little NFT system and grow lettuce. Lettuce and greens are the easiest thing to grow. I would start with an NFT system if I was doing something indoor. Uh, pump hydroponics. Have you heard of a RAM pump? I have not. Can someone tell me what module Paul has connected to the Nano? This is the BNO55. Okay, the BNO055 nine-axis inertial measurement sensor, which gives you the quaternions directly, which is really neat. Uh, and in case you haven't seen this thing working, in case you guys tuned in late, you see I track in the virtual world whatever this thing does in the real world, including the really hard vertical cases. I kind of lost the orientation between them, but you can see whatever I do in the real world happens in the virtual world. Uh, Have you tried aeroponic systems? They're cheap to make and work great. Yeah, the thing that I just worry about with the aeroponics, I haven't done it, but I'm worried about the clogging issue because I'm constantly in normal hydroponics 
fighting with clogging and filters and small orifices. And so trying to deal with the clogging would be the thing that I would fear about. Now, when I go to Africa, I'm going to do something that is new, or maybe it's not new, but I'm going to do like an open loop aquaponics. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a big fish tank that I'm going to grow tilapia in. And then I'm, I'm by the river, so I'm going to pump the water from the river for the fish tank. And then the dirty water from the fish tank, I'm going to overpopulate the fish tank. And the dirty water from the fish tank, I'm going to use to water my organic garden. And so it's going to be kind of like a nutrient-rich water. But I'm not going to then try to capture it and then recirculate it back to the original tank. And I'm going to be growing in soil, not in a growing medium. And so it's going to be like an open loop hydroponic. And I've actually got a guy there that is really, really into the fish farming. And he's going to, he's going to work with me on this, uh, on this project. I don't have a picture right now of my organic garden. I've got a picture here of my compound. I can show you. This is what I've gotten built so far. And then uh, you can see right there on the river. And I haven't built the main house yet, but I am uh, getting around to that. And then kind of between these red roof buildings is where we got our little organic business, uh, our organic farming project going. And it's actually going well. We're producing quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of food. Uh, I will check out a ram pump. I don't know uh, what that is. Why does an Arduino count to 255? Because that's like 8 bits. I think like 2 to the 8 is 256. And if you start with 0, it's 255. And so it just depends on how many bits you have. But 256 and 1024 are powers of 8. Okay, uh, I don't know what a ram pump is. I will check it out. My name is not Micro. Oh, okay, <laughs> Mirko. Sorry. Uh, it means that Mirko means to be peaceful. Oh, okay. Well, that's great. And that's, uh, I appreciate that you're not <laughs> offended if somebody messes up your name. But man, who, what was all the nonsense? It's like I had to block 10 people from the channel. I don't understand why people would make themselves a nuisance. That aquaponics sounds like a great idea. Well, I will let you know. I was, uh, I will probably get started on that here shortly. I'm trying to wrap things, thing, wrap things up here and plan to permanently relocate to Africa, which is a continent. I've been there dozens of times. I really, really love it over there and hope to be there permanently here. What are each of the buildings for? Okay, got a question on each of the buildings. Okay, it is hard for me to point, but this is a dormitory, and it will house, house about eight people. It has a flushing a bathroom with a flushing toilet and a nice shower. It's got a little kitchen. This is a staff quarters, and there's four people that live there, like gardeners and guards. I have another staff quarters over. I can't point over that far. But if you look at the left at the gate, I have another staff quarters there that has been uh, built. Then this is a shipping container where I store things. Then this is an eco toilet. And so it is a composting toilet. It, you, it's much more sophisticated than an outhouse, but it's like an outhouse. But it's designed where it separates the pee from the poop. And so then things organically degrade in a way that there's no odor. And so there's no odor associated with that. And then it generates compost. And so then this is above the, uh, above the composting toilet. I have a, uh, what would you call it? It's a uh, compost pile where we're doing our composting. And then the next red building back that direction is a garage and a laundry and a shop, a woodworking shop, garage and laundry. And then a little one bedroom cottage above that. Very nice inside, very nice uh, uh, kitchen, very nice features. And then on the other side is a larger cottage. And then down by the river, we will build our main house. Okay. Is it any other? Uh, okay. No, no, man. I'm not offended. I just wanted to know. Uh, oh, okay. Very nice. Thank you. 
Uh, you were great. Thank you. Enjoy the knowledge. Keep up the great. Ram pump might be good for your aquaponics. I got to figure out what a ram pump is. I've never heard of it. Is it any other YouTube channels or blogs you recommend? I don't know. So many of them are just opening up stuff that people send them for free and say, oh, look, you know, somebody sent me the blah, blah, blah. Let's look at it. Like, I don't care about the Pi 4. You know, it's just like on the Raspberry Pi, all they're doing there is making faster Pis. To where me, the issue with the Raspberry Pi is not that I want to run 3D animations on. If I want to do that, I'll use a PC. What this is, is something that I can embed. So I would be much more interested in them adding analog input to this. I would be much more interested in a system that wouldn't be so per prone prone to corruption. It's very hard to embed this in a system because there's no easy way to have an on off switch. And if you lose power, you corrupt your card. So, so I don't know. I'm not interested in that stuff. And then so many of the YouTube channels, it's just people showing off what they've done and they never actually teach you how they do it. And so you can see cool things other people do. You can copy what they do, but you never learn to do things on your own. Okay. Why is the Adafruit sensor superior to a leak suppress module at half the price. I don't know what the other one is, but the question is, does the other one have the same core chip in it? And can you get the, uh, can you get the uh, quaternions off of it? And guess what I don't do is the Adafruit stuff is more expensive, but I don't go buy a cheap Chinese knockoff, you know, off Amazon and then go and use the Adafruit libraries. If I'm going to use the Adafruit libraries, I'm going to buy their chip because otherwise we're never going to have any libraries because you know, <laughs> it's like we're dooming ourselves to failure if we do that. I cannot do an ESP82 or a 32 because I just don't know where that platform's going. There's too many directions and too many hardware and too many software choices. Do you rent uh, the cottages? I do not. Uh, there's probably five people that live on the property. I have a property manager two guards, two full-time guards. I've got three gardeners and there's five people that live there and take care of things. And then when I'm there, I host a lot of visitors, but I don't actually try to make money. <clears throat> okay. Oh yeah. The, okay. I see. Yeah. The, the pie is green. And so it gets confused on the, on the green screen. I see what you're saying. Okay. Is the illegal, the illegal Arduino kit wasn't available in what they, I'm sure the e Lego kit is available. Technology is in wrong hand. They want you to consume, not learn a real, yeah. They want you to buy things and copy them, but not actually learn. And so that, if there's something different about my tutorial, you know, man, if, if you can learn everything I'm doing, that's great. If you become better at things than I am, that's great. I want the world to be a better place. And so I want you to teach you what I know. I want you to know how I think I really was a successful engineer. And I would like you guys to move in that, uh, in that direction. Okay. Uh, check out the something have you ever used i've not used an msp430 i don't know what that is did you redo the earlier arduino tutorials i see you have arduino to yeah the first series was called arduino lessons the second series is called arduino tutorials there was a lot of great technical content in the old series but the thing about the old series was was that the production quality was very low and it bugged me i was using screen capture and a webcam and the audio was out of sync with my mouth. So my mouth is doing one thing and the audio is different. That really, really bugged me. So I have much better production capability and I've gone a lot further. Like I said, we've got 65 lessons coming on this. The RAM pump will really appeal to your technological brain invented in the 1700s. Hey, the 1700s. Now I believe it is starting to ring a bell. And I think I saw something strange where it was like a guy had a tube that he put in a river and then somehow he was generating pumping action from the river itself where if I remember right, it was almost like water was going uphill just based on current flow, something strange like that. But given, if you look up here, the nice river that I am on, perhaps I should do a ramp pump. Let's see right here. You can't quite see very well in the picture, but I have a water tower and a water tank and I have an electric motor that I'm pumping water to the water tank. But if I could do that, 
uh, passively, that would be really great. Okay, I meant the Allegro Arduino kit isn't available in Norway. Oh my goodness. Okay, uh, I have not looked at Alexia Express. I have not looked at that yet. So hopefully, hopefully more of these things will be available in more places. Okay, let's see where we are here on this crazy, uh, this crazy business. Uh, I have kind of lost my place here. Give me a second to get back. Okay, you guys, if you have any last questions, we're probably going to be wrapping it up here pretty soon. Let me just see where we are here. Looking for some last questions. You need a hill for a ram pump. Can I be at the top of the hill or do I have to be at the bottom of the hill? Okay, Andrew says the part of the Pi project was to put cheap computers in the third world. That is really true. But the problem is, is that you can give a person in the third world the computer and they can't afford the screen. Okay, and then if you have something like this with a cable and a wall wart and they don't have electricity and then they need another cable and they need a screen and then they need electricity for the screen and you add all that up the truth is you would probably be cheaper to get a Chromebook by the time you got a screen and all the cables and everything to make this thing work and so I don't see this happening in the third world and I have been to the third world and it just doesn't work that way it doesn't work that way and so I don't know what the solution there is, but I, I, I would like to see something like the Pi because I do things where I do do things where uh, the Arduino, I need more power than what the Arduino can give. But the Raspberry Pi has not been really good for me as something to go to other than, uh, you know, other than the Arduino because of, again, this, that it's prone to the, uh, memory card getting corrupted and it's very hard to uh, it, it's not easy to have a simple on off switch without being connected to a without being connected to a computer what programming language do you recommend I am not a programming expert I know Arduino and I know Python and that is pretty much it Merco I need a DC motor to turn slowly but not weakly how do I manage it check out a stepper motor Okay, and there's a lesson coming out on that. Throw some ideas on PCB printing. I think we need to find a good place where there's free online resources and a good simple library and cheap low quantity builds on PCB printing. The problem is when I get into that, the software is so complicated and there's so many different options. I don't know, you know, I want something with a library. Hey, I want to drop a slot for an Arduino Nano into my project. It's already done the pin spacing stuff. So sort of drag and drop and draw lines simply. But that stuff is so complicated, I have not been able to figure it out. Okay, Pi still works. <clears throat> on a CRT TV, okay, but third world, no TVs are going to be around. Okay, hello. Uh, if you do a tutorial on the 9-axis, please show how you would code a second I2C sensor like the temperature and humidity sensor. Yeah, and you can run into problems on the Arduino, like you can use up your serial ports or you can use up your SCL, SDA. And so as we do things like on the, the space program where we send high altitude balloons to the edge of space we start running into limitations as far as how many things we can hook up have you used platformio instead of the art no i have not done that i have not done that but i can't use a stepper motor it's too expensive i must use a dc motor i don't know buddy because the dc motor is good like high speed low torque but low speed high torque that is going to be a tough one. If you get the little eLego kit, it has a stepper motor, and the whole kit is $35, and it includes a stepper motor. Okay, let's see here. We are going on an hour and 20 minutes, so I think I am going to shut this thing down. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I would like to periodically get together and just kind of do a shop talk like this. If you guys are interested, let me know. Again, I'm very sad I don't have my iced coffee today so I'm a little down but 
I will have it waiting for me when I get home. Okay, Paul McWhorter from TopTechBoy.com. I will talk to you guys later.